With that said, Mike, I'll hand it over to you to introduce the next panel. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I'm Michael Rosenblatt, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Flagship Pioneering, and I've been a longtime member of the Scientific Advisory uh, Group for this conference, and I'm really honored to introduce our next panel, which is entitled Industry and Investment Outlook. We're going to be looking at a collection of topics under that major heading. Uh, they include uh, looking at macroeconomic trends in the near and midterm and what their impact will be on biopharmaceutical investment. We're going to look at uh, health care and pricing. Uh, what uh, industry investment behavior makes no sense now and needs to change? And uh, of course, uh, on the near horizon are, is the U.S. presidential election and what direction that might have impact on investment. And uh, similarly, uh, the development of a COVID vaccine and a return to normal or near normal. Uh, we've assembled a real blue ribbon committee, uh, which is, are the members are gonna be introduced to you in just a moment. I have the pleasure of introducing Andy Klump. He's the chairman of the overall of this entire conference and uh, it's MC. And uh, he's also the president of R&D at Takeda, and I'm honored to have him as a longtime friend. So, Andy, I'm passing the baton back to you. Terrific. Thank you very much for the really kind introduction, Mike. And I have to admit that as the master of ceremonies, I'm always conflicted because whenever I host a panel and put a team together like this one, I want it to be the best. So as MC, I'm always conflicted. So I've decided that we just have a, all the panels are great, and this one is just really great. So with that said, let me quickly introduce the panelists. And I would encourage you to, to put up the Hollywood Squares um, image, because we're going to be trying to make this dynamic to have to see how everybody interacts with one another. We're going to try to keep it lively, keep it flowing. Um, it's a group that is quite um, familiar with one another. So that allows for a really provocative discussion um, uh, and uh, no hurt feelings. So uh, introducing the panel, we have Daphne Zohar. Hi, Daphne. Daphne is the founder and CEO of PureTech, which is a really exciting and interesting new way of thinking about um, drug discovery and drug development. We have my former boss and friend, Elias Sirhuni. Elias is now a professor emeritus at Johns Hopkins, but before that, uh, head of R&D for many, many years at Sanofi, ran the NIH during the, the Bush years, and before that, a very... Uh, um, successful career at Hopkins, entrepreneur, the list goes on and on, Elias. Chris Wiebacher, who also doesn't need much of an introduction, he's now the managing partner at Burnett Point uh, Capital. Um, Chris, before that, was the CEO at uh, Sanofi, and before that, a long and illustrative career in many, many countries at uh, GSK. And then, last but not least, and you've already seen Stelios Papadopoulos um, earlier on in his terrific fireside chat with Ken Frazier is the chairman at Biogen. He's the uh, co-founder and chairman at Exelixis and a long uh, history in the healthcare industry and in investment banking. So really looking forward to um, stepping into this panel. And I will start um, with you, Stelios, but Chris, you feel free to jump in. Um, tell us what's happening in, in the world in, from a macroeconomic standpoint. What do you see happening today? What do you see happening in the near future? And then specifically, what do you see the effects of some of the disruptions that we're seeing today and some of what you expect to happen tomorrow on healthcare investment? Well, this is, um, thank you, um, Andy, and a pleasure to be with um, everybody again. Uh, this is a large, wide, open-ended question, and I will not attempt to address all the points, but uh, let me focus a little bit on the investment community's reaction to what's going on right now, and particularly to our sector. It's a bit odd if you think about it, that uh, we are in the worst pandemic of our lifetimes. For sure, none, none of us has seen, or hopefully we'll, we'll see again, something of this magnitude and severity. Uh, and at the same time, the stock market has been setting records for the last several months. It's odd, it's peculiar. Now, why is that happening and why is our sector the beneficiary of this? Uh, the largest underlying force here is there's an imbalance in supply and demand for investment opportunities. 
there is excess liquidity in the world for sure. That money, typically, the larger portion of capital goes into the fixed income markets. But interest rates have been so low and are predicted to remain low, there's little interest in investing in fixed income securities. So that brings you into equities. And if you look at equities, and now there's an avalanche of capital because, as I said, the fixed income markets are two, three times the size of the equity markets or more. When you look at equities, clearly you don't want to invest today in leisure entertainment, in travel, in consumer goods, in commercial real estate. These are all sectors that are clearly suffering from, um, from the pandemic. That leaves you just a few things, high technology, information technology systems, um, and obviously healthcare. Now, healthcare historically has been a defensive sector on the assumption that people get sick, no matter what the markets are, you could even argue they may get sick more in difficult economic and social and, and health environments. But at the same time, uniquely now, not only we're a defensive sector, we're also an offensive, if I can coin that term, in the sense that if there's going to be a solution to this pandemic, and I'm confident there will be, although I may debate the timing with a number of my colleagues in the industry, uh, it's gonna come from us. So we have this opportunity for huge upside and also the limited downside. And that I think is what is driving money into our sector. What would I worry about, as you pointed out? Well, at some point, as the pandemic comes out of control, if you look at Delta Airlines, American Airlines, if you look at those stocks, how much they've been beat up, typical investor behavior sector rotation. They'll shift money away from parts of the market that have overperformed into those that are likely not to explode during a recovery. So as the recovery becomes visible, I expect money to shift out of where we are. Also, and I will allow the other panel members to comment on this, potential disappointments with the work we're doing, setbacks. You know, will there be a vaccine in October, or in November, or in January? Will it be a good vaccine? Will it not? Will the antibodies work? All these things come with daily adjusted expectations, and those can introduce some fatigue in the marketplace at some point and some huge disappointment. So I, I'll stop right here because this is a topic worthy a lot of conversation. Everybody else should chime in, I believe. So, so you're, you're predicting a little bit of a downturn in, in industry investment as we start to hit some bumpy road, roads downstream. Chris, any additional thoughts from you? You're, Chris, you're on mute. You're on mute. Just broke the first rule of Zoom 101. Um, the, um, just to put a few numbers around what Stelio said, um, if you look at the capital that has flowed at least into public equities and healthcare in terms of IPOs, pipes, or secondary offerings, it's uh, year to date $31 billion. <clears throat> and to put that in context, at the same time in 2019, this was $17 billion. So um, interestingly, in a period where everybody has uh, been at home and not been able to get out and travel, actually money has, has not only been flowing into the sector, but it's been flowing into the sector by getting deals done. Um, if you talk to investment bankers, uh, they are as busy as, as ever. We've seen some, some major acquisitions this year. Um, and, you know, certainly even IPOs. I mean, Stelios in a, in a preparatory call was noting that actually the pandemic is probably an advantage for an IPO because where you, you know, you spent 10 days getting tired running around uh, the world in a, on, on a plane, um, you can do this thing in three days and see a lot more people and you're probably fresher and, and uh, able to you know, do your pitch better. One of the things that is usually a factor though, that if you sort of say, who's gonna take away the punch bowl, and it's usually the threat of, um, of pricing uh, reform. And, you know, I remember back in 2003, I'd just become the president of GSK North America and the chairman of GSK from the UK was there and asking, how long can the US uh, defy economic gravity? And you know, and I've had to answer this question about, you know, when are we going to see something happen on pricing for 17 years? And arguably, the only thing that's really happened is the consolidation of payers. I mean, the, the, the you know, Express Scripts and, and CVS Caremark have done what no government has done in, in terms of really uh, eliminating price increases. But I think we've got stability. This is a really complex system. We've just finished uh, two years where we've had a, a House of Representatives that was desperate to do something on, on drug pricing. We've got someone in the White House who's desperate to do something on pricing. And it hasn't been able to, to really work. 
So I, I'm not sure that we're going to see it. We never, you can never say never, but I think, uh, you know, um, that you doesn't seem to be can you, can you hear me okay? Chris, can I you can hear me? I hear you, but I'm, I'm, my, I, this says, I'm, oh, there we are. My, there we mine are. wasn't on mute. Okay. <laughs> so I don't think, I don't think pricing is necessarily going to be the big factor. It doesn't seem to be coming into this election like it did in 2016. Maybe, uh, Elias, I'm going to turn to Daphne, but I want to set you up. I love when physicians and scientists and R&D heads get asked questions about pricing. It used mm -hmm. to be five years ago that we were told, that don't, don't, don't go there. It's a third rail. Save it for somebody else. And, but now we're all in this discussion. So I'm curious on your thoughts on not just drug pricing, but healthcare costs and where you see things headed and where we can perhaps be more responsible. Um, before we get there, though, kind of continuing along this investment thesis, Daphne, uh, you know, we all wake up, read the Wall Street Journal, we read uh, John Carroll's uh, brilliant work in Endpoints, and every once in a while we, we say, oh, why, why was that investment made, or why is that number, why is that number so large? What, what do you think of some of the practices that we have today that just don't make sense? That we I think I may have done that in the uh, controller, because I was... I'm hearing an echo in the background. Yeah, yeah, me too. If I could ask some of the technical folks to go on mute, if you're in, if you're in the green room. I need to mute the gallery. Okay. Good. Thanks, Sandy, and and hello, everyone. Yes. Yeah, so I think it's really interesting because several people have mentioned today that the industry that more capital needs to come into the industry. And uh, while I agree with you know in terms of significantly investing more in basic science and translational research, I completely agree with that. But I also think that um, as an industry, we could look back and see if there's practices uh, that we employ that that might actually uh, be changed in order to improve the impact of the money that we end up spending. So um, that's you know a general comment. And at PureTech, we did something really unusual in that we started and built a biopharma company with actually very little resources. So in doing that, it wasn't by choice, but we actually learned a few things that I think could be relevant um, for the industry. So for example, uh, one of the things that um, I think would be really important would be to kill projects early, but there's a whole incentive mechanism that is in place that can yeah, pay people see. a lot of money before getting to proof of concept and before getting to an approved drug. And so there's a lot of um, financial incentives that may not necessarily be aligned with uh, what we're trying to accomplish in the industry. So I think one, one thing that we could do differently is set up a motivation incentive structure that enables people to kill projects early. Uh, another thing I think that could be very interesting would be to um, enable bigger companies to be a little bit more entrepreneurial and, and nimble. And that means scaling down decision-making uh, when you're making decisions that relate to smaller amounts of money uh, to be able to be a little bit less cumbersome. So those are some ideas, but I think generally I'd love to hear what others think about the idea of the incentive structure that we have in place, which tends to be somewhat short-term versus the long-term horizon and the many failures. Can you give us, an example, give us an example of something that you're doing at Pure Tech to incentivize the kind of dis rapid, incisive decision-making that you're talking about? Yeah, so we, we've set up Pure Tech such that there's um, the ability to move resources very quickly between projects. And we actually, as a management team, are motivated to kill projects early because the resources will move to, um, to better projects. So we've set that up. We've incentivized the team to do that. And um, our structure is set up to do that. Whereas if you're in a traditional biotech company, there tends to be a bias to continue. Even if you get mixed results, you, you want to keep going. You want to you know, keep the company going. So this concept of of setting up uh, a structure like that, I think makes sense. The other thing is is doing experiments that don't cost a lot of money, but could kill the project. And you'd be surprised how much resistance there usually is to doing that. Terrific, thanks, Daphne. All right, Elias, what's the answer to pricing and healthcare cost control? Well, you know, there's a revolution going on. I mean, pricing, I sort of agree with Chris in the way that when you look at the statistics, uh, pricing has not gone up. You know, on average, you know, the cost of drugs is 15% of the total and yes, one, big, like one, was one, one, two percent a year, something like that. So it's not a, as much of a problem as it was 10 years ago for the total system. I think what you're seeing in healthcare is a little bit what we saw in the PBMs, and that is so the point of view, I don't know who's talking, um, 
but from the point of view, can you hear me okay? And we can. There's a little bit of background noise, which I think is the technical staff, and I'm just going to ask them to please go on mute. But we do hear you, Elias, through that. Okay. So from 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 the point of view of the market, I mean, you can see consolidation. I mean, healthcare systems are consolidating. Everybody's sort of coming together. I mean, it's rare now that you see an independent hospital, even in Boston, and that leads to what you would call optimization of delivery. And so all the hospitals are right now working on formularies and, and clinical pathways and, and trying to control costs that way. Um, you also see new entrants, I mean, technology companies. You can see CVS is trying to open minute clinics. Digital health okay. is going to be a major player because you can access now cheaply, uh, virtually, 80% uh, of the needs of primary care. And I think you're going to see that happening on a the, on the grand scale. From the point of view of R&D, what I feel is that, as, as Delios and, and Chris were mentioning, we are in the golden era right now because cost of capital is very low. There is a yes. lot of capital yeah. available. I just uh, faded in some activities. I mean, the interest rates for a multi-billion dollar uh, loan is less than 1%. Yeah, and in some regions of the world, it's negative. I think that we have to be prepared because this is a bubble. Of the yin yang, if you will. And that will be driven by what? Interest rates going up, taxes going up, depending on the election. I mean, if capital gains are changed or dividend pay, uh, payments are changed, that will happen and we'll have to adapt to it. But I think there are two trends that I believe are really essential to understanding the investment dynamics. One is, you know, typically investors invested in big pharma. That is not providing the returns that you, you would expect uh, in terms of innovation, simply because innovation has changed. Today, you're not talking about vertical organizations that do everything. You're really talking about big networks of innovation around the world. So innovation is distributed. And because of that, you're going to see investments in new ideas at a pace that you didn't have before, because there were not a lot of new ideas coming from the traditional uh, investment channels, if you will. And you're seeing it. I mean, you're seeing it in, in your survey. I mean, cell therapy. I mean, you know, it's a hard thing to do, but it will, it will grow. And investors are willing to take a chance earlier, as Daphne was saying but in a way that is more distributed, where the risk is more hedged, if you will, ag across many different ideas. I think, you know, if you ask me what is going to grow is really the, co the concept of multi-targeting, where you're not going to do one drug for one pathway, but one drug for different nodes in the pathway. So there'll be a change in, in, in the nature of re the, the research we do. It's happening in front of our eyes. You'll see a lot of diagnostics grow, biomarker uh, field. The field of biomarkers is going to grow to help us develop drugs, but also treat patients more precisely. Healthcare systems are going to consolidate, and they are. And I, at the end of the day, I think the, um, the, the, the healthcare system moves very slowly. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think we're going to see ups and downs and booms and busts in different areas at different times. Andy, may, may I chime in for a second? I Please. I, I want to emphasize a couple of points made by uh, Chris and Elias in, in regarding IPOs. This is the first time in the 40-year history of the stock market for biotech where a preponderance of IPOs consistently trade above the IPO price. This never happened before. And if you're a money manager out there, a professional running money, and you see this performance and you've been benchmarked against all sorts of market measures, you got to be indexed into that sector. So that creates incremental demand. Demand begets performance, performance begets demand, comes a virtual cycle, you know, in that regard, until something happens. And when the bubble bursts, I don't want to call this a bubble, Larry, now because there's a lot of exciting fundamental science, but when that excitement somehow has reason to sit back for a moment and take measure of what's going on, then prices could drop precipitously. And what that trigger is going to be is usually unpredictable because if we knew it, we could deal with it ahead of time. But the fact that just about every IPO this year is trading above the offer price is a remarkable event. 
Never happened before. Chris, Chris, I'll just Elliot, one more please quick, point, quick point, Andy. If you look and if you've been active in this uh, biotech investing and pharma investing, the number of players has multiplied. I mean, Chris can comment. I remember in 2011, we acquired Genzyme and M&A operation that I, he can talk about, which was brilliant. But at that time, I can tell you the number of players that could compete with you were very, very, it was very small and I let him comment. But today, if you look at the number of outfits who can channel investments, both singly or in, in syndication, it's three times what it was. So there's more, there are more players willing to do that and it, it, it feeds into that, uh, that, um, that wheel that uh, Alex Stelios is talking about. Maybe Chris, tell, go back to the story of, of Genzyme, which was at a very different time. You're coming out of the housing crisis and the, the, the recession that ensued. Healthcare investment was actually at a very different place. Maybe walk us through a little bit kind of what happened and how you would compare where we are today to where we were then. Well, you know, back in those days, uh, every big pharma was still trying to source all of the innovation really more in-house. Um, and, you know, at Sanofi, we, we were a small molecule house and, and needed to make the leap to, to biotech. Um, and, and we identified Genzyme. Um, it was in 2010. Um, and we did it, it really to get a, a, a presence in, in, in the best ecosystem there is in the world, which was Boston, um, to try to make that leap to, to biotech, but also to try to bring in a more entrepreneurial culture um, into, the, into the company. One of the side effects of that transaction, though, was <clears throat> up until then, the strategy had been $5 billion transaction, string of pearls type approach. And we borrowed $20 billion in 2010 at 1.8%. And as one investor said, you know, you could have bought yogurt and it would have been accretive. I mean, the, 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 the ability of, of, of cheap Pretty debt cheaper. to really uh, drive value was, was quite amazing. And actually, if you go back and look at the biotech index, it really started to take off um, from, from that point uh, in time. But it was this whole notion of, you know, we needed to, to have a lot more of an external focus. To do that, we needed to have a presence in, in an ecosystem and, and, and people that um, knew how to collaborate. You know, today, I mean, the world is completely different. 70% of the, the, the pharma, pharmaceutical pipeline is in companies with market caps of $10 billion or less, that less. This is completely different than when I started in this industry 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, I think that has really enabled uh, research and development to, to, to really go. I mean, Daphne talks about the, the slowness of when you're dealing with a big pharma on, 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 on sort of the sell side to them, we just kind of came to the conclusion that you're never gonna really create innovation um, on, a, on a large scale inside of large corporations. And, and I think um, the other thing is, is that by, by outsourcing that, it's not just a different model, but you know, one of the things I noticed when we did, for instance, the Regeneron deal was, this was a way for me in Sanofi to access a different source of capital because the capital that was behind Sanofi was only interested in what Atlantis did last quarter. They weren't interested in, in the pipeline. But I go and listen to Len Schleifer at JP Morgan, and I had a different fidelity in his meeting than was in ours. And that capital was interested in pipelines. That capital was much more risk oriented. And so I think this outsourcing and, and collaborative approach to R&D is not only good from a people point of view, but it allows big companies kind of escape their um, treadmill of, of quarterly earnings and tap into innovation um, for people who have a different um, and more risk-oriented capital behind them. You know, by the way, Stelios was giving an investment tip. You had made the suggestion of investing in yogurt. Stelios just wanted to clarify, I don't know if everybody heard it, but it was Greek yogurt. I think that's what you said. <laughs> At some appropriate time, I will even distinguish different brands of Greek yogurt. All right, well, yeah. Rajiv, Rajiv Paul these. is listening, so please. But that, All right. then that, you know, Andy, can I ask a question? Please. I mean, as we see all these technology sh shifts, you know, the, the way innovation is done is different. And can I ask the question to all uh, the, the panelists, Stelios, Chris, and Daphne, do you foresee uh, an increased wave of mergers of big companies like we've seen between you and Shire? Uh, 
Takeda and Shire and Celgene and BMS and Allergan and what is the guy? What are you guys reading? Because this is a very interesting question of of supply demand and 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 market power, right? Yeah. I mean, Maybe the ends of complicated and. What are we going to see? Great question. Are we are we kind of where are we headed in terms of M and A? Stelios, maybe you can comment, and sure. then Daphne, maybe from a kind of a, a budding pharmaceutical company, you can offer some of your your thoughts as well. I mean, my my thought on the matter is, what drives big company mergers is usually the attempt to solve a problem. Everybody who's done something is trying to solve a particular problem. If you, I'll remind you, Chris. 10 years ago, back, you used to go around and timidly say, I want to desanify Sanofi. That's the term you had coined. <laughs> and I never forgot that because it was very telling. You were creating, you were, you were attempting through catalytic events to dramatically change a company. There was a problem you were trying to solve. And you could go on probably offline and talk, why Takeda did Shire? Why BMS did Celgene? Why did Pfizer do Wanna Lambert Pharmacy and all of that? And that will persist. The creation, the emergence of problems within large pharma will continuously exist. And it's typically, but not exclusively, driven by expiration of intellectual property protection. When you have stochastically like a bunch of drugs, you know, Pfizer coined the term uh, the cliff in November 2011, the Lipitor patent was to expire. And that at the time was the biggest selling drug in the industry. That was the cliff. And they were just looking at it with, with, with fear. So bottom line is, yes, they will continue, but the universe is so small. Each one is a separate story, all of itself, all by itself. So it's not trends or secular force or anything else. It's just people trying to solve a problem and an acquisition is a potential solution to the problem. What do you think, Daphne, from your, from your point of view at Pure Tech? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be pretty bad for the industry if there's all these big me mega mergers. I think they tend to kill. Um, some of the innovative things that are happening within those organizations. And I also think it's kind of interesting to look back. And if you ask anybody in the industry, what, it, what defines it? You know, the first thing would be patience and, and making a difference. But the second thing they probably say is innovation. And it reminds me of that, that phrase from the, the Princess Bride where, you know, the, he says, you keep using that, that term. And I don't think it means what you think it means. Because this is an industry that's actually very good at pattern recognition. And pattern recognition is almost the opposite of what you want when you want to incentivize innovation. So we're good at being fast followers, I mean, as an industry. And I think that there is um, there is innovation that bubbles up, but that happens through the innovation ecosystem, through academic translation and things like that. So I'm going to ask you, Chris, where we're headed, it, more or less M&A, but I just have to just pause and underscore the fact that we are the coolest panel. We just quoted the Princess Bride. Yes, I'm light on culture, on popular culture. What is that? Oh, Felios. Oh. No, you just <laughs> back. Well, offline. We'll work with you offline. Chris. Well, I, 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 I first, I, I completely agree with uh, Stelios. These, these tend to be um, one-off uh, solutions, and you, you, you go after a major deal when you've got a major problem, and you have to move the needle pretty quickly. Um, you know, if you've got uh, a product like Humira and you you want to dilute its importance in your portfolio. You 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 got to do something bigger. You can't you can't do that with with one off deals. Um, I, I would argue on um, the merits. I mean, I, I think uh, today the only way that scale really benefits a company is in commercialization. And I think uh, big pharma will 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 still rule that. It, it's very difficult for smaller companies to go and and sell to every country in, in the world. And, and as long as they have that, um, you know, I think uh, big pharma is still going to stay at the top of the food chain. Um, but I, I think most companies have the critical mass they, they need. So I don't think critical mass is going to drive it. It is if I've got a hole and I need to fill the hole, I'll do that. Um, but I don't think anybody's really trying to get bigger for bigger sake. Um, and I, I think there is a general recognition of something that Daphne said is that actually I think scale can be... Um, can actually uh, hurt innovation. And, 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 and not, Here's a question. Any of you can take it. You just made me think of this, Chris. So, you know, if you if you go back ten or fifteen or twenty years and you look at the top ten pharma companies in terms of market cap or revenue, and you look at them today, there's a little bit of evolution. There's a little. There's a, you know, Amgen steps into the that mix. In and out gets the ad and but but not a lot. What do you predict in if you go ahead ten or fifteen years? Do we see 
more, less, or the same kind of movement in terms of that top 10 list? I, I mean, uh, I think, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I was going to say, I think I, I can imagine similar brand names on there, but I think the contents will probably be different because they'll, they'll, uh, absorb an awful lot of the companies in there. And, and and let's face it, the dream of every biotech and every investor is that one day a big pharma comes along because nobody will pay more for your company than, than a big pharma. So so they will absorb that. So I could see that there'll be some shifting um, in, in, in the mix, but perhaps not an awful lot, but they won't be in the same way that Sanofi. I mean, you know, when we we uh, if you if you look at Sanofi uh, today, um, it, it it's nothing to do with what the the company where Elias and I started ten years ago. The whole product mix has changed. The whole um, uh, focus of the company has changed. So, um, I I think actually some of these big companies have gotten very good at actually you know just keeping a regular set of growth and bringing they've figured out how to bring the right amount of innovation, um, and you know they generate massive cash flow. I mean. Uh, you know, that's what caused me. I mean, Sanofi was a mess when I took it on, but it was generating 11 billion euro free cash flow every year. I mean, if you have cash flow, you have solutions. Yeah. So you're, you're predicting um, uh, J and J, Pfizer, Novartis, Merck, Pure Tech. Is that, is that your top five? Yes. <laughs> Stelio, and, and, and the point is this. I mean, if we say, well, Pfizer was there, Pfizer is still here. Well, Pfizer, but what's Pfizer? Yeah. Legacy Pfizer, Rorig, or Warner Lambert, or Wyeth, or Pharmacia, all of which have been absorbed. All the names we used to know, where Shering Plow, Siba Geigi, Sandoz, uh, and you go on and on and on, Squib, you know, now Celgene into BMS. So it's it's evolving. Yeah. But you're, but you're critical saying, what Chris said. You're all saying more of the same, basically. It's kind of kind of looked the same with evolution, not dramatic. Elias, go ahead, your thoughts. Well, let me say something different because there's something that drives the value of a company. It is nonlinear, all right? If you look at the returns on, and, and market value, it's all driven by robustness. So a company that doesn't have one tends to fall off the top 10 and sometimes gets, gets back down. So. The, the, the business is not a linear business. It's a very non-linear business that's related to specific hits uh, of uh, blockbusters. So the question really would be, where are the blockbusters likely to happen and which companies are going to acquire them early enough to get the value or not? And, and I think there is this sort of uh, noisy uh, environment which allows big companies that have a lot of cash to survive and by making the right choices. But look at all the companies that have gone away that are no longer there. Elliot, so, I want to go back to something that you raised earlier, which is the election. And I just have a softball for maybe Chris and Daphne and anybody else who wants to uh, kind of step in and take it on. The softball question is, who's going to win in the U.S. in November? Who's going to win? I want a name. And what's what's the consequence to the investment thesis in healthcare? So I, I personally think it's it right now it's too close to, to call, um, and because uh, the polls are narrowing, and you have all these shy Trump voters, and you know the, that's why the polls didn't work the last time. So I I I actually don't know. What I would say is. You know, I think the industry will work with whoever um, wins. I mean, uh, I spent, used to spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill, and I used to say not every Republican is our friend, not every Democrat is our enemy on that. I mean, they have different approaches. Um, you know, we had a, an Obama administration that controlled both uh, houses of Congress. We had the Affordable Care Act. We were moaning and, and wailing because we had to pay, all, I think, uh, $110 billion in taxes over, over 10 years. But actually, we gained in volume. Um, you know, maybe Democrats will focus a little bit more on pricing, but they tend to uh, focus a lot more on coverage. And and so, if you look, I mean, we closed the donut hole um, and gained on on uh, volume. We expanded Medicaid and and we expanded on volume. Um, and you know, you have Republicans on the other hand who are free traders. They're more likely to be interested in bringing parallel trade, looking at the pricing in Europe. And, and I think the success of the industry has been not in winning over pu public opinion, because we've actually been lousy at that. But long ago, they decided, 
prevent bad things from happening in Congress because virtually everybody in Congress knows someone in their family who has been sick and actually recognizes the, the solutions that we bring and recognizes that, you know, when I started in this industry in Germany um, in 1988, Europe spent twice as much or 50% more on R&D than the U.S. Uh, Bayer was uh, and, and Herxt were the biggest uh, companies in, in the world. And now the, the U.S. Is, is the dominant player in, in technology. And this is a strategic industry. It's a, it's a, it's a hard argument to win in, in a world of sound bites. But I, I think the industry is actually more effective than most people give it credit for. In, in getting its value proposition across to, to those in, in, in halls of power. So we'll have to morph and adapt, but I think you know, the industry can do that. It's great. So, well, so you, what you're saying is you're, you're, you have a, you're positive, we'll see what happens. Daphne, can you do this in a soundbite? Can you answer with one word who's gonna win the election and one word what the consequence will be? I can't answer that question, but what I think we, sh we need to do is, is do something about this war on truth and science and create some sort of bipartisan approach to doing that because that's the thing that's the biggest concern, not who necessarily wins this election. Great. Let me, I, so I'm not a terrible moderator. Let me reach out. I know there are a couple of questions on the, uh, from the, from the audience and I think I'm going to open it up to Sam Waxhall. Sam, if you could, you know, quickly go through your question and then pick on somebody to answer it. And you're on mute. You're, you're pulling a crispy Bakker. <laughs> I, I, I can't, think of anybody better uh, uh, to, to pull on. But anyway, Daphne, I love that you quoted uh, uh, Princess Bride. I think, uh, you know, what's fascinating is I always use one of the characters there when I think about innovation, the Wallace Shawn character, who, uh, when he was promoting his intelligence, said, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, morons. So in, in order to really, you know, I always believe that human memory uh, uh, exists to predict the future. And one of the things for all of you, and as I listen to, to how you all think about things, how do you look at picking the right technology? I mean, innovation is, a, uh, is not something you teach. It happens. But new technologies occur, new products, new pathways. How do you all choose? And, and a couple of you here have to do this for all of you have to do this for a living, actually. All right. So we don't have we don't have any time left. Because we don't have any time left. I'm gonna give this one to you, Daphne, because you this is what you do right now for a living. If you could quickly give Sam the answer. Yeah, I mean, we start with a, a disease focus or a theme. We bring together leading experts, an orthogonal perspective, so clinicians, academicians, entrepreneurs. And then we take an unbiased modality agnostic approach to solving the problem, looking at academic labs and um, bringing together basically the best science. Terrific. Thank you. I want to thank you, Sam. Simba, I'm sorry we didn't get to your question. I know that you had one. And I wanted to thank this, this great panel for a really terrific discussion. I want to also remind all of you in the audience that we have a polling question coming up. So please stay on and answer that question. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks. Bye-bye.